I just thought it might be great if we could just do a little sing-along. Once you get the words, just sing them out. Here we go. Every day is a day of thanksgiving. God's been so good to me. Every day he blesses me. Every day is a day of thanksgiving. Take the time to glorify the Lord today. You got the words? Come on, sing with me. day should be a day of thanksgiving. Good morning, Bowen Hills Baptist Church family. This final Sunday of the month of January. A few announcements for you this morning. Uh, the newsletter, the February newsletter, I'll be trying to put in the mail this coming week, so please be looking for that. The uh, February birthdays, that will also be in the letter, but I'll mention them here. Uh, February the 1st, Rosa Jones' birthday, Fortress Capo on February the 4th, Pat King on February the 10th, Hattie Ross on February the 14th, and uh, Dwayne Williams on February 20th. They are our February birthday people. February uh, is a month of Black History Month. Uh, President's Day will be on the 15th and also Valentine's Day on the Sunday this year will be on the 14th. So men, don't forget to do your duty on Valentine's Day. You may occur a few problems if you don't. Please remember to be praying for the sick in our church and the uh, bereaved uh, uh, members. Uh, we still have uh, some extra programs from uh, uh, Eleanor Williams' funeral 
And if you would like to have a, a copy of that home lawn service, please uh, contact uh, uh, Dana or Dorothy Thomas or someone. Uh, they will be here at the church uh, on Saturday and you can get a copy if you come this way. Uh, my final ex uh, uh, exam for my eye will be on the 14th of this month. So far everything is looking good and I'm hoping that this final exam will tell me that the eye has healed uh, well. Uh, Henry Harris will be going in the, to get the results for his um, colonoscopy uh, this month and so please uh, uh, keep Henry in prayer. Uh, I called Hattie to check on her and tell me that she was doing uh, well. She was resting at the time that I called. Now this is uh, your vaccination month. This is very important that you get your vaccination, that you follow the schedule. If you're 65 and older, this is the time that there are uh, vaccinated uh, people. I have not gotten mine yet. Uh, we missed the uh, opportunity on Friday because the slots are filled up very quickly uh, at the form. So uh, Mrs. Robertson and I will be trying this coming week very much so to get our, our vaccination. Uh, please continue to pray for our country. Uh, we need a lot of prayer. Ask God to have mercy on the, the United States of America. Pray for our president, vice president, and the Houses of Congress and the judicial branch. Uh, God hears his people. And so we're the ones that need to be sincerely, earnestly praying for a company, country. So please be sure to do so. Let's pray together at this time. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to look at your word. And we pray that the Spirit of God will use the word of God in our lives that it would produce the fruit in our lives that you want it to produce. Help us to be open to your word and to have a burning desire to be pleasing to you on a daily basis. Lord, we pray that God the Holy Spirit will help me to preach it in clarity so that your people might understand your word and be able to benefit from him. So enable me now as I bring your word before you people. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen. Now, this is a Life of Christ series, so get your sermon outline out and your sermon scriptures as we continue to look at the credentials of our Savior. We're dealing with Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 through the 37. And I want to read that passage uh, for us at this time. So uh, get your scriptures and get your sermon outline. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. He does make the tree good and his fruit good, or make the tree bad and his fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account for it in the, the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And so we are looking at our Lord uh, giving his credentials to be Israel's true Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God. And he has made his credentials clear. He's been minister now for about a year uh, and a half or so, take or give a few uh, months. The religious leaders of the nation have made clear also their rejection of him and his 
Fidenzo. They are on a path bent to attempt to find an opportunity to put him to death. He responds to their accusation of him being demon-possessed and that his signs were being done by Satan's power and not God's. Today, we see how serious it is to put off salvation and to not let God work in your lives as believers in Christ. That's serious as well. So look with me at our title for our sermon today. The Lord pronounces eternal judgment on Israel's hardened religious leaders. Now look at this. Look at the title. Pronounces as God. He pronounces eternal judgment. It's over for them. He is pronouncing eternal judgment. And in our passage, he gives the reason for it. And these are Israel's hard religious leaders with the responsibility to bring the nation to God and proclaim before them that Jesus Christ indeed as he claimed is the Son of God, their true Messiah. They failed in doing that. And consequently, we're taking the nation into judgment. The first thing I want to say to you from our outline today is because they blaspheme the Holy Spirit. That's why he's pronouncing this sentence of eternal judgment on them. They blaspheme God, the Holy Spirit. And that's seen in verses 31 and 32. But first note what the Lord said. <clears throat> All other blasphemies could be forgiven. First part of verse 31. Look at it. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people. Any sin or blasphemy shall be forgiven people. And then look at the uh, uh, other passage. Mark uh, is the passage that is uh, harmonized with the Matthew passage. Mark chapter 3 verse 28. Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the Son to man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. So the Lord is making a general statement that uh, uh, if a person repents and uh, turns to Christ, and though he has been a blasphemer against God and against Christ, it will be forgiven him. In other words, he can be saved. God will express mercy and save his soul. But no. The blasphemy against the Holy Spirit was an unforgivable sin. The Lord makes that known in the second part of verse 31. But blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. That's God's decision. Blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Now keep in mind, this is not a just general statement. It is a statement in the context, which we'll look at uh, in a moment. And you've got to keep that in mind. Uh, you can make the Bible say anything out of context. But remember, we are focusing on the, the Lord's ministry and uh, demonstration of His credentials before His people. And so he's making this statement in that context that he's been ministering now for about a year and a half, give or take a few uh, months for sure, to Israel and presented uh, multiple evidences, healing people, casting out demons and everything. Just uh, uh, overwhelming the nation with the credentials that he is the Savior, the Son of God. And it was necessary because they needed to be saved. He was the only hope. And here he was in front of them. They don't need to miss him. And so the Lord has given clear testimony. Now, Peter testified that Christ's ministry was in the power of the Holy Spirit. We see that in Acts chapter 10 verse 38. He says to that audience that he is speaking to, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit. You know all that. And with power. And how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. 
course, we respect God. We were there because it was His Son, His only begotten Son, who pleased Him in everything. God, the eternal Son in human flesh, walking among mankind, getting ready to be the Redeemer of the nation. No, a word spoken against Christ could be forgiven. Even the Son of Man, a word spoken against Him could be forgiven. Uh, some folk may have earnestly missed him or uh, were deceived at the moment. But later, uh, looking at the evidence and uh, making consideration, uh, listening to Peter in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, could change their mind. Peter called the nation to repent. So though they may have had some prior uh, decisions and prior ideas or opinions about Christ, uh, they were faced with another opportunity and uh, Peter said repent and of course you know 3,000 people on that day repented so a word spoken against Christ could be forgiven the first part of verse 32 look at it whoever speaks a word against the son of man it shall be forgiven him please note Paul was forgiven who spoke a word against the son of man Acts chapter 26, verse 11, uh, giving his testimony before King Agrippa. Listen to what he says, So look at what he said. And as I punished them, that is believers, uh, who he was persecuting, them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme, to blaspheme. He said, I tried to get them to deny that Christ was the Son of God. I tried to get them to blaspheme and being fiercely enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. And remember, he was heading up north onto Damascus with authority for the chief priest to bring back any Jews that were uh, believers in Christ up there, bring them back for punishment when God met him on the Damascus road and saved his soul. He was 100% wrong. He was deceived to the hell. He hadn't seen the ministry of Christ, but evidently he heard of him through the religious leaders and so forth and made his decision and was 100% wrong. But then, when Christ confronted him, then he repented. Lord, what would you have me to do? And you know we know him now as the great apostle to the Gentiles, handpicked by Christ to bring us unto God. And then he said in 1 Timothy, to Timothy, chapter 1, verse 13, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. I acted ignorantly. I didn't see the Lord's credentials. I acted ignorantly. And God knew that and God uh, forgave me. Please note, whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit can never be forgiven. That's what the Lord said. Whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit can never be forgiven. Now remember the context. He's talking about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. All right? Please note, look at the, the, uh, the verse, the second part of verse 32. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven him, either in this age, in the age of human history, or in the age to come. That is, in the eternal state, probably in reference to that, when God uh, finishes everything. Look at the Mark passage, the companion passage from Mark chapter 3, verses 29 to 30. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. So salvation is out for them. Uh, they can't be saved. They're guilty of an eternal sin. Look at verse 30. Because they were saying, here's the reason. Because these religious leaders were saying, he has an unclean spirit. They were saying he was demon-possessed, and his miracles, we looked, remember from last week's message, were done in the power of Beelzebub, the prince of the demons. Satan gave him his power 
You don't have to be deceived and believe that He is our Savior, our Messiah, and missing everything. And yet the evidence is right in their face. And yet they blaspheme the Holy Spirit, who was indeed doing the, the wonders and the signs and the miracles through the Son of God. Please note, remember Mark 3, verse 22, what they said. The scribes, religious leaders, the students of scriptures, who interpreted the scripture, remember, who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub, and he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. And so they were attributing the Spirit's work to the devil. When it was obvious that this was God working and that Satan couldn't do these works. Now look at this very important truth. I need you to see this and understand it. This sin cannot be repeated today. This sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, cannot be repeated today. It is a sin of context. The exact circumstances would have to be duplicated. The Lord would have to come back on earth, the religious leaders once again would have to see the signs and wonders, and then uh, make the same conclusion. Uh, say that he's not doing this by the power of God, he's doing it by the power of Beelzebub, for he indeed is demon possessed. It is a sin of context. You need to understand that. Now, those who are involved in hyper emotional religious and uh, religion and uh, deliverance ministries and so forth accuse those who reject their miracle and healing ministries of committing the unpardonable sin. That's what they say. Now remember, this is not a matter of uh, debating people and their views. We're talking about looking at the scriptures and what the scriptures have to say. Now we can't accept these miracles and healing and all that is claimed to go on. Uh, not only has it been uh, uh, many times uh, demonstrated, even by the world, by unsaved people, of the uh, hypocrisy and the falseness that is going on there. But the Lord himself warned us that this would be so. So we can't blindly run in and grab and accept something because someone claims it. We've got to look at the scripture. The Lord himself blamed or uh, warned us. He warned us. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse uh, 21 through uh, 23. Listen to what he said. The Lord warned of deceivers who would come and deceive people. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Look at the passage. It's in our Bible. Some people act like this passage is not in there. You can't just ignore this passage. Well, that's too hard for me to understand. Well, that's why God gave teachers and men trained in His Word He called to lead His flock. So that we would teach and explain the, the truth to His people. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who makes a profession of faith in Jesus and calls me Lord is going to heaven. Not everyone. Making a professor of faith, just a mere professor of faith, won't get you to heaven. It's got to be real. It's got to be genuine. Look at what the rest of the verse says. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Those who believe on me are turned from their sin, put their faith in me, and listen to what my Father has said to me in his word and through my apostles. They're the ones who will enter. They're the ones who give genuine evidence of being born again. But look at those who will not enter in verse 22 and verse 23. Many, not a few, but many will say to me on that day, what day, Lord? The day of judgment. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. Well, they, there's their professing, they're saying, Lord, Lord. But look at what they claim. Do we not prophesy in your name? We predicted things. We predicted future events like the Old Testament prophets did. We prophesied in your name. And look at this. And in your name we cast out those demons. Just like your disciples did. Just like you did. In your name we did all this. And, no, 
and in your name we perform many miracles. We perform miracles in your name. Now how in the world are they not going to be his? How in the world are they going to not be real? But note what he said, even though they had the language, Lord, Lord, not everyone who said Lord, Lord will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But know what he says in verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Never knew you. You never actually turned from your sin and put your faith in me and allowed God the Holy Spirit to born you anew. You never were actually saved. You deceived yourself. The devil deceived you. You never were mine. I never knew you. Not that I knew you. One time you lost your salvation. I never knew you. You never had salvation. You never were mine. Even though you made the profession of faith. Oh, what a dangerous place to be in. Faking it. Being a hypocrite. Being uh, religious and, and claiming all kinds of stuff. And not even saying. Listen to what he ends up. He said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Very interesting that the devil is called the lawless one. So these false miracle workers, uh, these people were deceived. The Lord said they weren't even here. He said, so having told us this in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, then we need to be careful as serious students of scripture. We need to scrutinize all these claims that these folk are making today. We're just trying to be what God wants us to be, trying to follow the truth, that's all. And so therefore, uh, if we reject these ministries then, uh, and say they are not uh, bound, they're not of the Holy Spirit, because they're not following scripture, we are not committing the unpardonable sin. Not at all. That's a lie that the devil took. And notice this. Paul also warned our apostle, the apostle to the Gentiles. Seven times the Lord appeared to him and gave him the revelation that he wanted communicated to us. And we have it written in the Bible. Thirteen books of the New Testament he wrote. And so our apostle, Saul Tarsus, now Paul, also warned us that deceivers will come in several passages. But this just this one passage. Look at the one passage. Second Timothy, this final letter to Timothy, Second Timothy 3, verse 15. He said, But evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Deceiving other people? And guess what? being deceived themselves, maybe by others that are in the movement with them, or maybe just deceiving themselves from the standpoint that they believe this stuff to be real, they believe this stuff to be true. Deceiving themselves, deceiving others, and being deceived themselves. We live in a time when the deception is massive. This is the time of the apostasy of the church, when the Lord uh, warned, Paul warned that the church would apostatize, would move away from historic orthodox doctrine, and would go to uh, entertainment, tickling people's ears and saying things that people wanted to hear, and depart from preaching and teaching God's clear word and revelation. And we live at that time. We we'll fool ourselves if we think it is not the case. Time of false teachers, false miracle. Workers are taking multitudes into a lost eternity with them. And that's sad, but that is true. Look, the second thing I want to say is that the Lord exposed the truth about man's heart in verses 33 through 35. It came out and made it clear some things that related to the religious leaders, but in general about man's heart. Please note, the Lord exposed the truth about man's heart. Notice what he said. He said, consider a tree and its fruit. You see that in verse 33. Consider what a good tree produces. Uh, consider that a good tree produces good fruit. First part of verse 33. 
either make the tree good and its fruit good. And he's calling them to, uh, uh, and this is a logical uh, sense uh, argument. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the, uh, or the opposite. Uh, he's dealing with reality as he is talking uh, to them about uh, something that they understood, that good trees had good fruit on it. And when he says make, he is saying, he is uh, using make in the sense of consider this, you know, let's reason, let's deal with logical uh, truth. Then he says, consider that a bad true tree produces bad fruit, the second part of verse 33, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. Now he's reaching now for uh, their minds and their understanding with that that they know about trees. Now, he goes on to say, the type of tree is known by its fruit. That's the third, final part of verse 33. For the tree is known by its fruit. So, either consider the tree being a good tree, producing good fruit, or consider the tree being a bad tree, producing bad fruit. For a tree, as you know, is known by its fruit. Now, look at the Luke passage, Luke chapter 6, verse 43 and 44, the Lord uh, making a, a comment also in that passage, a comment that they uh, really knew. For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit. A good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. Nor, on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit. Those that doesn't happen. Verse 44, for each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. If they were trying to do that, we would assume that something was wrong with them, with that person. And so it was something, it was a fact that they knew. The tree must be one or the other. It's either a good tree or a bad tree. And that's the reality that they do. Now no, the Lord's point was this. He was doing good works through the signs and wonders and the miracles. Therefore, he must be good. All right? No, he could not be evil and produce good works. If he had a demon, if he was doing these things by the power of the, devil, of the devil, who is evil, the demon is evil, then these works, which are good, could not be produced by evil. So he's giving them reason with them. Now, they knew the truth, but denied it and rejected their only savior, their only hope. He was not just another prophet, uh, the nation killed the prophets, uh, stoned them, and rejected God in their history. And he was just not just another prophet. He was the final prophet that Moses talked about that was coming. He holds the office of prophet, priest, and king. But he was just not a, you know, some people would say that, well, Christ was a good man. They tried to put him up on the shelf as being a good man. Uh, you can't do that. His claims were too great. He claimed, he claimed to be the very Son of God Himself, sent by the Father to redeem Israel. And uh, if, if He is not all that He claimed to be, then He is the worst fraud in human history. So He's not just another prophet, someone we can put up on the shelf and push aside and say, well, He's just another prophet. He is the Creator Himself. Chief architect of the Creator, the very Son of God. Now the religious leaders knew that the signs and wonders and miracles were from God. There was supernatural power, but because they didn't want to receive Him, they rejected His uh, uh, testimony, and He was doing miracles and wonders on the Sabbath day, and uh, so forth. They were just mixed up as they could be, and therefore were thinking about other uh, things that they needed to do and not receive him, this quiet Messiah. They weren't interested. Proof that they knew is seen in John chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Nicodemus, remember he came to Christ at night. 
look at uh, verses 1 and 2 of John 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees, that Orthodox group, who believed the Bible, believed in the angels, and believed in the uh, uh, spirits and so forth. His name was Nicodemus, and no, a ruler of the Jews. So he held a ruling position on the Sanhedrin of the Jews, and in that very passage, the Lord recognized him as being the teacher of Israel, and yet he didn't know some things, since you go down in John 3. And so he was a Sanhedrin, ruler of the nation, and notice what he says in verse 2. This man came to Jesus by night. He had to come by night because if he came in the daytime, the other Jews would recognize something's going on. Maybe he was believing. So he came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, teacher, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. We know this. He was one man that was honest of the rulers. Joseph of Arimathea demonstrated that he also uh, was honest and became a believer. Remember, he asked for the body of Christ to be taken down from, uh, from the cross and buried Christ's body in his own team, uh, tomb until he was resurrected. And so they knew, they knew that he was from God. Now, it's glad that to know the truth and reject it. Couldn't get any sadder than that. Woe are you if you know the truth and reject it because of your agenda or some other things that you have in mind. We see that all the time today. People who know the truth but they reject it because they have a hidden agenda. Now look also, the Lord confirmed the connection of the religious leaders heart and their mouth. Now they pronounced these things from their mouth. <coughs> accused him of being demon possessed, accused him of doing the miracles by uh, Satan. And so all this came out of their mouth. So they made these pronouncements. But the Lord now <coughs> is going to show that there is a connection between their heart, their being, their innermost thoughts and desires and what they are as a man thinking in his heart, Jesus said, so is he. Not what he wants to be, but if he thinks in his heart, so is he. That's what he really is. But so the pronouncements came out of their mouth, and that's going to show that connection between the heart and the mouth. Now, they were hardened sinners, these religious leaders, in a desperate situation. John the Baptist made that clear when he encountered them in Matthew chapter 3 verse 7, look at the verse. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, now this is a strange bit fellows. The Pharisees were orthodox, they believed the Bible. Sadducees were liberal, were, uh, liberals. They didn't believe in angels and uh, they didn't believe in, in the resurrection. And uh, yet these two got together to come into John for baptism, but they weren't really real. And we know that because of how John responded to them. Look at that passage. When John saw many, many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come in for baptism, he said to them, You rude of vipers. Now, that's not the most gracious words to try to win people, is it? Yeah, John recognized that they were a brood of vipers, poisonous snakes. Uh, he knew well what they were. And therefore, he was startled by the fact that they were coming. And so he said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Who warned you to flee? Come to me to be baptized and so forth. But he said all that because it really wasn't real. It wasn't real. <coughs> no. Like poisonous snakes, the religious leaders were deceptive and dangerous. You know, snakes try to blend in with the background. They used to look like they blend in with the background and cults and so forth. And most of the time, when people are bit by snakes, they don't see them first. 
Well, they would, you know, stop and get out the way. Don't get too close. And so the deceptive snake hiding in the uh, the uh, west pond of the ground uh, is very dangerous because he strikes with quickness and he bites people. And so he said in uh, verse 34, this is the Lord speaking, not John the Baptist, you brought a fight, you brought of, uh, of vipers. How can you be an evil speak what is good? How can you be an evil on the side speak something good out of uh, your mouth? How can you be evil inside and speak something good? Their evil heart produced evil speech. That's what he was saying to them. Second part of verse 34. Now therefore, because their hearts were evil, they spoke evil of Christ. Look at the verse. For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. That's a general principle. The mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. What you are on the inside will come out of your mouth eventually. No question about it. <clears throat> Look at uh, Matthew 23, verse 15. Compare that passage. The Lord is speaking. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, one to convert him to Judaism, and then when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves with their lies and with their raggedy, uh, conflicted lifestyle that he now sees. Influence, and that's the way to live. It's okay to live that way. So he becomes worse to them. Now, no. <clears throat> Both good and evil men reveal what is in the, the heart. The Lord said in verse 35. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. The thoughts, the heart, the thoughts, the ambitions, the desires, the loves, the loyalties, uh, the uh, attitudes, and all that. All that comes from the inside, comes from the heart. Look at the Luke 6, 45 passage. Commenting the same thing, but making clear to us that this is the heart he's talking about. The good man, out of the good presence of his heart, <clears throat> brings forth what is good. An evil man, out of the evil treasures, bring forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Therefore, Proverbs 4.23 says, Watch over your heart, church of the enemy. Watch over your heart with all diligence. For from it flows the springs of life. What your life is all about, what kind of person you will be, Come from the inside, come from your heart. You gotta watch over your heart. You gotta make some serious decisions that are for Christ and for right. You gotta be transparent, you gotta be real, you gotta be true on the inside. Otherwise, you'll be a hypocrite. And it's gonna be seen. Final thing I want to say to you today from our passage is the Lord affirms that in the judgment, mankind, not just these religious leaders, but mankind will give an account for what they have spoken. So what comes out of our mouth is important, and in the day of judgment, it will matter greatly. Verse 36 to 37. No, every careless word will be accounted for. Verse 36. Every flippant word, every word that we consider nothing, that we just say because that's the way we are, that comes out of our mouth from the heart, uh, offensive remarks and so forth, reveals what's really going on in the inside, reveals what we really are. Look at the verse. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account of in the day of 
each other. Careless words, useless words, worthless words, flippant, irresponsible words, things that we just say to people that hurt people, or just some attitude, and it comes out of our mouth. No, mankind will be justified or condemned by their words. Verse 37. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Now, the use, what our Lord is saying here, that our words uh, will give evidence of what we are. If we're genuinely born again, our words will make that clear. And if we're not born again, it will be very clear in the review of the words that we have said over the years. Good words are truthful, kind, loving, healing words, and wise words. That would be the good words. Evil words that will condemn will be lying words, deceitful words, lustful words, cursing, uh, hurtful words will all give evidence that there's nothing on the inside but evil. Yet the evidence that we don't know Christ as a personal Savior. No. Therefore, we must make every effort to guard our tongues. Our tongue is what speaks the words that are inside the heart. Listen to James, what he said in James chapter 3, verse 5 to 6 about the tongue. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great it fires is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. The tongue, the uncontrollable tongue, set on fire by hell, Satan's influence. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18 shows the contrast of an evil tongue with a good tongue. There is one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword. You know, just throws things out, people hurt people, just speak rashly. <coughs> We know people like that, you have to walk on eggshells around them. But the tongue of the wise, spiritually wise, brings healing. Good words, kind words, that will help. Please do. The Lord pronounces eternal judgment on Israel's hardened religious leaders. They crossed over the line. They went too far, far. They rejected God and He rejected them. Their words revealed their sinful, lost, hardened condition of their hearts. No question about it. Now they were lost forever. No way back. No changing. They were gone. They saw the ministry of Christ and His power, obviously by the Holy Spirit, rejected that and said He was demon possessed and said all these miracles and wonders, all these healing, the blind seeing, the lame were walking, people being resurrected from the dead were done in the power of Satan. And God said, uh oh, you can't be saved. It's over for you. And God rejected them. Now as believers in Christ, we need to remember, as I told you so many times, we will give an account of our words also. Surely saying, bought by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ shed for us on Calvary's cross. But it matters what we do with our tongue, our member should be directed towards righteousness. And so there ought to be chains in our speech because there's supposed to be chains on the, the inside, the chains from our hearts. 
We got to allow God to work in our life and to transform us. Got to allow God, the Holy Spirit, produce His fruit in our life. So we be gentle, loving people who love one another. Put control on that slander and this is tongue that so many have. And that maybe all be set in sin. But we need to give that to the Lord. We need to ask God to work on that so we can turn from that. Because we will give an account of our tongue of the words that have come out of our mouth in the judgment. And for us who are believers, it will destroy our reward. We may actually see our tongue set fire to our reward, see it burned up, because we didn't guard our tongue. The Old Testament says, the book of Proverbs, we need to guard our tongue. The New Testament says the same thing. We need to guard our tongue. And the question is, Will we take the challenge to allow God to work in our lives and to mold us in the very image and character of Jesus Christ? That's the goal of our progressive sanctification. That God is working in our lives. There we are growing to be better Christians, to be more committed, to be willing servants of our living God. May that be so for you and also for God bless you on this final day of January. One month gone already. Get ready to roll into February. May 21 be a great year for us as we allow God to work in our lives for His glory and honor. God bless you, church family.